It's no secret that Kotlin is my favorite programming language, period. It has all the bells and whistles I value in a language and it just feels efficient and expressive to write code in it. One of my favorite features are extension functions, which Kotlin's standard library heavily relies on. However, there are many functions that are missing in day-to-day -day programming. Luckily, the Kotlin devs are adding more, frequently with no releases. Nevertheless, there's still quite some that I started copying around projects because I require them so frequently and they're not in the standard library. Find out now which are my personal top 10 of generally applicable standard library as extension functions that I would love to see in a standard library one day. First of all, if you're not really familiar yet with extension functions and you would like a dedicated episode of my series Idiomatic Kotlin on it, let me know in the comments. And check out that series in the top right corner if you haven't watched any of the episodes yet. But now, let's get into the top 10, starting from number 10 naturally. Let's kick it off with an extension function that is pretty nifty, but not incredibly versatile. It's not critical enough to make it higher on the list. There's also not much explanation necessary. All that happens here is that the elements of a given pair A to B are swapped around to make up a pair B to A going forward. All fully type safe, of course. I'll present you with one example where I used this in a real project in a moment after introducing another extension function required for the example. When I started programming in Kotlin, this was one of the first where I wondered why is it not in a standard library to begin with. I'm talking about a way to construct a triple, which is part of the standard library after all, with the same extension function that can be used to construct a pair. I'm talking of course about the two extension function. Why is there an option to chain another two behind it to construct a triple? My major guess is that it would produce code that is not very memory efficient, since you would have to produce a pair in a process first that is then immediately garbage collected again. Not very nice. And that is precisely why I took the second to last place in the list. It can be pretty useful, but has a major downside. Now we are slowly moving into the interesting territory. The idea of this one is exactly what it sounds like. The given lambda expression is only executed if the boolean that it's executed on is true or false, respectively. What is the point of that? There's also something that does precisely that, right? A good old if statement. You might have already guessed the use case where this can become useful. That's right when integrated into a processing chain that would otherwise have to be broken up to slide in the if statement. I don't need it very often, but when I do, the code looks a lot sleeker immediately. This next one is only interesting to you people out there that write Kotlin code with the JVM as a target platform. Since those are very likely still the majority though, it made the seventh place on my list. One of the killer features of Kotlin is of course the nullability support and the added safety it brings a pain point for pretty much every Java programmer and developers in general. As you might know, Java patched on a similar concept of a union type-esque parameterized class in version 7 that can either be empty or hold a value, the optional. So naturally, when using Java within your Kotlin code, another strong suit of the language, you might encounter optionals that are just pojos though after all and are thus by far not as useful as Kotlin's nullable types. Therefore, all this extension function does is convert an optional into a nullable Kotlin type, retaining the information. I made heavy use of this in mixed language projects in the past. This one has a lot more limited use cases, however once I do need it, it's a pain that it's missing from the standard library, the Cartesian product. If your math class is already too far in the past, let's have a quick refresher. It's not a hard concept to understand after all. The whole idea is that two sets are combined into pairs with each element of both. Naturally, this will lead to a new set of pairs that can be really useful to calculate stuff that is made up of binary relationships. A real example where I used this in a project of mine is to generate a match schedule for a league of sports teams, where you want every team to play every other team at the same point somewhere in the season, a Cartesian product. And as a matter of fact, after you did that, you can easily generate a second lag of the season with the earlier presented pair.swap. Cool, right? We made it halfway to the top already. Number 5 on my list is really useful for displaying rankings or for statistical calculations. You are likely familiar with the dot take function that just allows you to literally take the first n elements of an ordered collection into a new one. The one that I added here builds upon that to take a percentage of elements out of the original collection instead of a fixed number. The nice thing about this of course is that the caller of the function does not need to be concerned with how many elements are in the collection currently. 
The main downside, albeit a small one, is that it's a bit awkward to pass a percentage to this function. One has to choose a certain format for the function argument, which cannot be checked statically, compared to a plain integer for the take function. Apart from that, I use this very often for projects in the past. This one is simply about merging a collection of maps of the same parameterized types into a single map to look up something out of it. The important thing to note with this one is the value merge function argument that gets passed to it. The reason being that it can of course happen that the merge maps contain different values for the same key, which requires that those values are now merged into a single one again. I'll explain in a moment when we talk about another spot on this list, how this one can be made a lot more useful. Bear with me. It's top 3 time. This is the one from the list that could make it to the standard library the easiest in my opinion, and honestly it's a bit shocking to me that it's not there yet. I have to be honest here and say that I cheated a bit, since the bronze medal on this list is actually taken by a larger set of extension functions regarding the closed range interface of Kotlin's standard library. The idea simply being that we can represent the range of values between two other values without actually having every value in between in memory. A range of numbers between two other numbers is the most obvious example for this one. It's really nice to see this built in, while at the same time it's such a shame that it has so little features compared to other range types out of external libraries. If there is a parameterized type for having a closed range, why in hell are the only two functions that it offers contains and is empty? So for this one, I just wish that someone would take a look at Guava's range and simply add some of those functions that seem really useful. For instance, encloses, intersects, enclose all, span, and many more. I seriously used these in my projects a lot in the past and added them myself as extension functions always. This last one before number one is pretty straightforward again. It's essentially the same as the earlier shown pair.swap, although it has a lot more use cases. All that happens here is that each key value pair in a map is reversed or swapped around, such that the keys become values and vice versa. The use case for this is pretty obvious and I'm fairly certain that many of you ran into this problem in the past. For whatever reason you want to query a map by the values to find a certain key. The issue of course is that a map usually doesn't allow for duplicates in the key set. Therefore, to make this one really useful you need to use a multi-map, so a map that does allow for duplicate keys. Since Kotlin doesn't have one yet, it's not high on the list, although I would like to see both added to the standard library if I'd had a wish. I use a multi-map pretty often for situations where a key points to a list of values, something that is very common even though the handling of the list is pretty cumbersome to hiding that fact behind an interface, which is precisely what a multi-map offers. And by the way, a multi-map would also eliminate the need for the value merging lambda in the earlier function to merge multiple maps into a single one. And here is my number one. The idea here is that you give a lambda expression that acts as a predicate to this extension function and you will be returned a floating point number between 0 and 1, representing a percentage, to show how many elements of the collection test positive to the given property. I personally use this in a lot of situations where I want to display statistics to the user, or for various statistical applications themselves. This one is number one for various reasons. I use it the most often out of all of them by far. I like it functionally the most, also in the sense of how easy the implementation can be. Finally, it's the one I personally think would be the best fit into the existing collections API of Kotlin in terms of the semantics. And that's it. But wait, there's more in a bit. These are my top 10 extension functions that I'd like to see in the Kotlin standard library one day. You know what's gonna follow, aren't you? Let me know in the comments which one you wrote for yourself in the past, I'd love to hear about it, seriously. Likewise, if you have a question about any of the extension functions in the list, drop me a comment below likewise. After all, however, it's not that bad if those never will be in a standard library in one way or another, due to the very nature of the extension function mechanism. The cost of writing your own is tiny compared to the gained boost in productivity and expressiveness. And the fact that I could even make this top 10 presenting you functionalities that integrate so seamlessly into a piece of code that figure out which is from the standard library and which isn't is a testament to the extension function itself. They are very powerful and before the end of this video I want to highlight two of the reasons that makes them so powerful that might not be super obvious. The first one may be a bit more than the latter. Firstly, many built-in extension functions like your map, 
filter, take, group by and many more lend themselves or are even meant to be chained together in a pipeline to look something like this. Now think about how this would look like if all of those were just static methods. I'm aware that the ones on collections and strings could also be defined on the types themselves, but even then, the ones that work on any type, such as the scope functions, which I by the way also made an episode of Idiomatic Kotlin if you're interested, you cannot just define a method in every single type otherwise, of course. This is the first reason that makes extension functions so powerful. Secondly, since JetBrains, at least originally, is a vendor of IDE software, it's no surprise that Kotlin is integrated into IntelliJ so insanely well. The level of seamlessness is pretty much unrivaled when it comes to other languages and IDE combinations. One of the big features of IntelliJ IDEA is the code completion, of course. And due to the fact that so much functionality of the standard library is implemented as extension functions, I can just start typing a dot and I'm presented with a plethora of awesome things I can do next. When I first picked up Kotlin, this made it exceptionally fun to learn due to this exploration factor being a combination of the extension functions and IntelliJ IDEA. On the flip side, think about how many standard library functionalities are implemented in Java, for instance. One just has to know them by heart, start googling or consult the documentation. Especially as a starter, quite discouraging, isn't it? In Kotlin, the code is almost flying onto the canvas. That makes me wonder. I'm not sure if this is just me, or did you feel the same when first picking up Kotlin? And likewise, is this one of the main marketing cornerstones of what makes Kotlin a big one in terms of developer happiness? If someone from JetBrains is watching, I'd love to know if this is the case. For me personally, this explorative synergy is one of the biggest reasons that makes Kotlin the awesome language that it is. So, to summarize. Due to extension functions, one can easily live without some APIs that would be nice to have in the standard library, simply because one can just add them manually with ease, something that isn't as straightforward in most other languages. Hence, my point is that without extension functions, much of what I just described wouldn't be possible and Kotlin would not be the same language that it is. Let me know if you agree or not. Thanks for watching and consider subscribing to the channel for many more videos like this one. Give this video a like if you enjoyed it and I see you in the next one. Tschüss!